Welcome to the corner of oil, gas, and technology. This is episode five of the Oil and Gas Young Professionals podcast, and I'm your host, James Gordy. Today, Jake Corley of GDS Where gives us his story, how he co-founded an oil and gas startup, the oil and gas data problem, funding and venture capital, and finally, how to know if you're ready to be an entrepreneur. All right, and on this week's show, we have Jake Corley, co-founder of GDS Where. Jake, welcome in. Thanks for thanks for giving me your time. Hey, thanks for having me, James. Okay, so one question we always start off with, Jake, how did you get into oil and gas and how did you find yourself now at GDS Where? Oh man. Do you want the do you want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> uh the somewhat long answer. The somewhat long answer. Okay. Um never did I ever think that I would end up in oil and gas. Um and I've really come to love the industry. Um I guess it all started. Let's kinda of go back a little bit in my background, I guess. Um I have a pretty heavy tech background, started off on the hardware side. Uh, in high school, I was working at um, a tech company to deal with a lot of uh, like car dealership systems called uh, Universal Computer Systems, or UCS for short. Uh, and then they actually merged with Reynolds & Reynolds, so that's kind of what the company is known as now. There's a lot of people who know that company. Uh, so I started working there in high school. I built computer systems for them, computer slash robotic systems. So I had that tech background. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps back in 2009, um, so they saw that background as a kind of an asset. Uh, so I actually went into communications maintenance from there, so still doing more tech stuff. So that really involved fixing any kind of uh, communications gear that broke out in the field or out on deployment. Um, so that can be radio gear or uh, data communication systems gear, and fixing that down to like the component or card level. Um, where, after that, where, after where were you located when you did this, or were you kind of traveling all around in the field? Uh, it was all over the place, mostly mostly California. Um, whenever you go into the military, they send you to your school uh, to kind of learn your trade there. And I was in Twenty Nine Palms, which is um, about forty five minutes from Palm Springs. Uh, it's in the desert, um, so I was there for a year, you know, kind of learning the the communications maintenance gig. Uh, and then from there, I was uh, stationed in Camp Pendleton, California, which is right smack dab in between uh, San Diego and Los Angeles. Okay. So it was a beautiful area. I love it. I, I miss it. Um, but after, you know, after doing that for, for so long, I was kind of burnt out on the hardware side. Um, and I kind of wanted to dive into being a developer, uh, writing code, you know, building things. I've always been a builder. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do. So whenever I got out, I moved back to moved back to Houston. Uh, I started going to school for computer science. Um, I was working. I, I felt like I needed a job that was really really flexible with with going to school, and so I became a personal trainer. I got certified while I was in the Marine Corps, um, and that allowed me to make good money, but also kind of make my own hours, um, kind of fit that around school. So it was kind of like the the perfect gig there, and I loved what I did. That was fun. Um, and that is actually how I got into oil and gas. So I met my now business partner through the gym. Um, we kind of just met by chance. Um, I kind of heard that he was a developer. We kind of sparked up a conversation. Um, he had been developing for, you know, ever since he was in his teens. Uh, he's about 40 now. And he offered to kind of be my mentor. And so we, I, I kind of blocked off Tuesdays and Thursdays on my schedule and he did the same thing. Um, and we would get together and he would teach me kind of like the real world way to actually write code uh, so rather than learning in a classroom. How much coding knowledge did you have before that? Were you watching videos online to try and learn? Did you learn that at school? Was he really helping you learn more quickly than you would be able to on your own? Uh, I learned more in my little mentorship with him uh, than I ever did in school or on my own. Um, I, you know, I did watch a lot of videos. There's a lot of interactive tools and stuff online, like code Academy, uh, code.org, uh, Khan Academy has some good stuff. That's uh, K H A N Academy. They teach, of course, a, a whole bunch of different things, but coding is one of those. Um, but the, I like the interactive platform better, like something like code Academy, uh, because you actually are required to write code kind of before you can go, go on to the next lesson. So it kind of, let you be a little bit more hands-on rather than just watching videos. Um, and that's kind of how our mentorship was too. Um, you know, he would, it was 
kind of like a mix between like the interactive side and kind of like school in a way. He would kind of cover some basic concepts um, of kind of like the next project that he wanted me to do. And he would say, okay, well, here's what I want you to build. And if you have questions, ask me. He was like, you can ask me as many questions as you want. It but was just you and him just sitting down learning? Yeah, just me and him. He was like, here's your deadline. And here's what I want you to build. And he was like, this is the real world. This is how like developers like work. So you should learn the way that you work. And there, so I've heard, and I'm trying to figure this out on my own, in my own off time and at night, but um, you, did you learn a specific language? Did he recommend one specifically or were you kind of learning HTML? How does that work? Because I mean, a lot of so, people coding is that, a Yeah, that's box. a great question. Myself, myself included, it's a black box. What is coding and all that? That's a great question. Uh, and the bigger question that nobody really ever covers, and you don't really learn this until you actually start kind of writing code is what do you want to write code for you know um do you want it to be on certain devices do you want it to be web-based do you want it to be very database driven uh do you want to build enterprise level software um you got to kind of figure out what you want and then do some research on what are some of the best languages for that um i started off with within school you don't have a choice you know they kind of um they, they throw a language at you and even within the same school um, from class to class, if I didn't pay attention, you know, I'd come into like, say, you know, computer science one, kind of a generic name, and you start off learning Java. And then I accidentally signed up for CompSci2, which I thought was a follow on, but it was CompSci2 to not Java, but to C Sharp. So I was having totally to learn. Different. Yeah, and they're completely, they're completely different in from syntax that's like the only difference between the languages it's it's the syntax and the order of things and kind of the nomenclature used to kind of call methods and, and the way that you, that you actually build the code um but once you kind of learn one language a lot of the kind of the methodology really translates from language to language okay got it um but you really have to figure out what you want to build and so when then when i started with him so i'd already i you know kind of dived into the java and to c sharp or no c c plus plus and then with him, it was C Sharp, ASP.NET, um, very Windows driven, um, really good for like enterprise level software. And that's what he had pretty much, I mean, he had experience with a lot of things, but that was the stuff that he had done most of his career. Um, and so that was completely new to me once again. Um, so that's, so we started there. Uh, and then let's see, where do we go from there? Okay, yeah, so he was, so he was my mentor for a while. What year? Um, this was 2013. Okay. 2013. I was fresh out of the Marine Corps. I uh, just started this mentorship. And then he showed me what is now our product. Uh, he had been building it over the course of, I think at that point, it was been about four years. Uh, you know, he was building the product that is now GDS. And uh, I had asked him, I was like, well, what are you doing with this? And he was like, well, you know, it's been a project. Um, what does GDS was, stand for? Uh, there's really no meaning behind okay, it. It's just, it. He just, he picks some letters and, and it good. is what it is. Okay. Um, Keep going. <laughs> everybody, a lot of people ask that and I'm like, I wish there was like a really good meaning behind it, but it's not. Um, so we, we were kind of sitting around having coffee, kind of doing one of our mentorship things. We were kind of taking, you know, planning on, you know, taking it to the next level. I was going to start diving deep into databases and we both kind of just like stopped and thought, you know, Hey, well, why don't we turn this into a company? Yeah. And we kind of got the wheels turning. We were like, okay, well, if we wanted to start a company, what would that look like? And what um, was the initial product? What did he envision it being? Or was he just kind of doing it as a hobby? Um, he, I mean, he had, a, he grew up in oil and gas. Uh, he, his family works very closely in oil and gas. And so he kind of knew the problems that existed. Yeah. Um, and so he, he built this in a way kind of from, from what his experiences were to really solve a lot of the problems that, um, you know, these companies were experiencing, okay. uh, which we can get into in a second, kind of dive deep into that. Um, and so let's see, where was I going with that? What, what does the company look like? What, what's, oh yeah. So what is the, so what does the company look like? And so we kind of, we kind of thought about it. I was in the middle of a semester at the time at school. Um, you know, I had a secure job. Uh, he was the CIO of a company at the time. Um, and so, but luckily for him, you know, he kind of had a lot of free time because, you know, kind of being at the top, he kind of 
just made his own schedule. Was that an, um, was he, that an oil company or a tech company or both? No, that was a that was a tech company okay. uh, in a completely different sector. Um, but he still had a lot of oil experience. Um, so we we kind of thought about it for a while, and a, a couple months went by. I think this is like early 2014, and we pulled the trigger on it. So we um, I left I left my job. I finished out my semester. Um, we got an office, set it all up. We had no clients at this point. Um, we got funding uh, pretty early on so, um, from some private investors. Can you um, can you go back a little bit there? So the yeah, what is the, I'm going to ask two questions here. What does that first office look like? Because this is you know that's that's a startup from the ground up. It was just you and him, like with your computers on the boxes that came in, or what? What sort of office setup we got going here? Um, so we were kind of fortunate at first, um, whenever we first started doing it, we were just kind of doing it out of our house, but we felt like if this is going to be our full-time gig, we needed a place to kind of like call our, our office. Uh, luckily we had connections on getting in some office space for practically free. Um, and so we capitalized on that, uh, which was kind of funny because it was like way bigger than we ever needed. Uh, and it was just, just like the two of us. And so we both like had offices like right next to each other. Uh, within this big office, so it was um, it, it was like you were in office space. This wasn't like co working space or anything. No, no, no this, yeah, this was actually like our office space. Um, so it's not so like Station pretty, or Start Houston, nothing like that. It's like actual no, office no, space. No, yeah, okay. it was hundred percent ours. Um, you know, we we came in there and it was this hideous like forest green, like the whole office. It was like mm-hmm. a I don't know what it, what it was before, maybe like a lawyer's office or something. Did you paint? Uh, yeah, we paint. That was like our first thing. It was like, man, we cannot look at this every day. Throw it on the whiteboard. We got to paint. <laughs> yeah, the first thing we did. So before we even moved in, so we got our wives out there. Um, and we just, you know, we bought some nice like gray or white paint or something and, you know, painted the whole office and made it look nice. And that was kind of like our first step in taking ownership of the place. And then, you know, I think that kind of helped us, you know, feel like the place was ours. Okay, so you got the office space, and then the other this is the second question I wanted to ask. You sort of just said, you know, we got some funding, but a lot of people don't know what that's like. I know the the startup podcast they talk a little bit about it, but um, that's that's on a different kind of a different scale. This is in oil and gas. What's how does a startup get funding? How did you get funding? You had some connections, maybe. Um, this one was through yeah, this was through people that we knew, um, and this kind of goes into knowing people and networking. Really, really helps. Um, because of our, because of the network now and through everybody that I know with oil and gas entrepreneurs and API and everybody that I've met outside of that and just kind of my own networking um, if I needed to start a new venture and I needed funding there's many people who would give me funding based on just knowing me Yeah. Um, and that's not to sound like cocky or anything but it's just that your network is your net worth um, and a lot of people don't understand what that means it means <laughs> literally if you need funding, that's like the first people that you should go to to get funding. So was this, um, were these venture capitalists or just people in your network? Did they get a percentage of GDS where as it was at that yes. time? Yes. In exchange for equity. It's just like Shark Tank. Is, can so, you tell us about, about that? I, mean, I don't know. I'm just curious because this is something you don't really get a peek into very often. Um, so with with this, it was uh, we had we'd pretty much negotiated an amount uh, in an equity stake. Um, it was Which very happened. favorable. Favorable for us. And then it put a valuation um, on it. So now like hey, we're worth this much. Y- yes and no. Um, we really never even, honestly, a valuation when we got funding never came into my mind. Okay. Um, because the way that I see it, um, and this is something you see on, on Shark Tank all the time. You see these guys come on there and they say, you know, I want $200,000 for, you know, X percentage. And they're like, you know, hey, we're valued at. Uh, we believe we're valued at $3 million and it's like, well, okay, well, how many sales do you have? And it's like, well, we don't have any. It's like, okay, well, if you don't have any sales, you're not valued at anything. Uh, and that's where we, that's what stage we were at. We didn't have any, we didn't have any sales. We didn't have any clients. So you just need and some so, money to kind of build the company and get it up. off. The yeah. Ground. We, yeah, we needed some, we needed some money to get off the ground. Um, and kind of just help us grow and scale and hold us over until we can actually start making money. Okay. Um, cause we were still pre-revenue. So, I never really thought about evaluation because I thought we were valued at nothing until we actually made money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of people need to actually look at their businesses that way. They get caught up in, you know, just raising so many entrepreneurs, especially in Silicon Valley. They're just always constantly striving towards the next round of funding, um, which 
in a sense, like taking funding should be like a terrible day for you because you're giving away part of your company. Exactly. And, uh, and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I'm just going to just give this away. And then, you know, they work eight or nine years and then they have an exit and they own, uh, you know, like 0.6% of their company and, you know, take a lot smaller chunk than they could have. Um, and a lot of people, you know, if you can, if you can not necessarily full on bootstrap, but if you can at least try to save as much, not necessarily save money, but not Maintain waste as much money. Yeah. Maybe have a little bit more patience, uh, in certain growth periods. And instead of thinking that throwing money at all of your problems is going to make your company grow a lot faster. Cause that's not always the case. Um, because if you're doing all of the wrong things and you throw more money at it, you're just wasting more money. You know, perhaps it's maybe the, the way that you position in the market or the way that you're targeting clients. It could be a sales or marketing problem. It could be a product problem. It could be a management problem, you know, but a lot of people are under the impression that, okay, we'll raise, you know, $20 million. We're just going to hire a whole bunch of people and all the problems are going to go away. And that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, and I think we've seen that with a lot of startups right now, um, not in the oil and gas space, but in just in general. I think that's kind of why we're in a, a huge startup bubble. But that's a whole other topic. Okay, so it, yeah, I got distracted because I just wanted to let people hear more about that. So you you get your funding and you get your office, and now you're building the company and the product, right? Yep, we are building. So we the products. I mean, like I said, it already been built for the past four years, um, and so uh, initially it was like we would come to the office and like, okay, what do we do? Like, how do, how do you run a startup? Let's let's figure this out. Um, what do we need to do with our days? Um, so at first it was a lot of me really learning oil and gas. Um, it was learning our product. It was learning exactly where we fit in the market. Um, is this I the needed part, to, which is this the part where I, we which, talk about what y'all do and the problems that you fix or is that later still? We can, we can jump into that. Okay. Um, so, so the, I mean, of course, before I started the company, I should probably talk a little bit about, I did my due diligence. You know, I, I did research, uh, other companies in the space um, you know, my, my partner had shown me a bunch of the different pieces of software that were out there. Um, and so it, it made sense, you know, I didn't just dive into something blind and kind of hope that we had a product fit, um, because it, it definitely made sense. I saw the problems out there. And then as I've gone along this journey, it's, it's even more prevalent these days. Um, so the, the, really the problem, uh, I guess we can, we can talk about this. Uh, the problem in, in oil and gas is it's really a data problem. Um, it's an upstream, midstream, downstream. Um, we are specifically an upstream. Our software is specifically for um, EMP companies, which is exploration and production companies. So anybody who actually pulls oil or natural gas out of the ground and, and sells it. So that, those, are, those are the people that we target. Um, we... How do I frame the problem? The problem is, in kind of the most basic sense, oil and gas, or at least upstream, lags behind by about 20 years in terms of technology. Lags uh, behind who or what? Uh, behind other industries. If you okay. look at like financial or yeah. you look at medical, you know, these guys usually had some of the latest technologies and uh, they embrace change. They embrace the latest technologies. Uh, they take risk on startups. And... Upstream oil and gas is complete, complete opposite. Um, the guys are completely set in their ways. They do not embrace new technologies. They think that they've been doing things the same way for 50 to 100 years. Why should they ever change? Um, and so because of that, it's kind of just like this, this mindset that you'll see um, you know, within upstream. And this has resulted in these companies still operating on uh, actual paper, uh, spreadsheets, hundreds if not thousands of spreadsheets, uh, and then probably some, you know, various, um, you know, antiquated pieces of software that was built probably in the early '90s, maybe mid '90s. Um, and so there's there's a lot of ways that they can actually improve the way that they run their businesses. The problem is that a lot of these companies, um, you know, they're using a the paper, using spreadsheets, or using software. So what do you use information and data for? You use your information and data to make decisions, okay? So the way these guys are making decisions is they're, they're looking through paper, they're looking through their spreadsheets, they're looking through their software, uh, and trying to make decisions based off of that, okay? So in 2016, whenever we have everything in absolute real time, 
you're able to, to find out anything you want to know via Google and the internet and your smartphone. Um, but these guys don't know um, how many wells they have online at any given time. Uh, they don't know how much oil and gas are producing at any given time. Uh, they don't know how much money they're making or how much money they're losing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so specifically losing right now. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's a lot of issues with that. So what we do is we provide them with a central cloud-based software that allows them to collect information, manage the information, analyze the information, and then report on it either internally or to the regulatory agencies. Um, and then we call it, it's kind of more of like an end-to-end -end solution. So it covers production operations, uh, accounting, regulatory, um, engineering, so on and so forth. Okay, so it's rather than, because the, the problem is that the information is, it's disparate. You've got it all over the place. It's dispersed in, in many different locations. So providing them with a single location to actually base their decisions on the information and store it, therefore you can, you can increase the efficiency of your operations. Um, that's, that's kind of really the, the basic overview. Uh, and then of course with that, you know, you can automate certain things, you can set reminders, you can set thresholds. Um, is there an things, app? Was that? Is there an app you use it on your computer? Is it just anywhere? Uh, it's completely web based. So we actually give them a URL. Okay. Um, and then they, they log in from there. Um, we do have native applications as well gotcha. for the field data collection side. Okay. Um, you know, whenever they're actually capturing, uh, gauge entries, run tickets, or uh, well status reports, anything like that. Um, they can enter that on their their iPhone, their Android phone, Windows phone, doesn't really matter. Okay. And then it all feeds into this one central system. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of other systems that are not. Uh, if it's not cloud based, then you're you're maintaining. Uh, a lot of times, what I've seen individual databases on each individual computer that has to be probably updated from a a main database, um, which can result in a lot of problems. Nobody really builds software that way anymore um, because of that. Um, you can just have differing information, which is really, in the most basic sense, no different than having you know a bunch of different spreadsheets with the same information. Um, it kind of creates a, a data integrity problem because you're never sure whether you can trust the data or not. Really, you're never sure if that was the last accurate you know measurement or a last accurate value that should have been in there. Um, you know, whenever you have, you know, say 10, maybe 10 spreadsheets for the same thing, right? So are all of these things that you just talked about, um, is that the, the data problem that we hear about? In, in yes, this is the data problem. And this is a problem from the smallest oil and gas companies, mom and pop shops. Okay. Uh, this is a problem for them. Uh, not as big of a problem because logistically speaking, their operations are a lot more simple and running an upstream oil and gas company is... It's, it's a, you're running a logistics company. Okay. So as you grow more people, as you grow more wells, uh, in more States, um, in different plays, it just becomes logistically more challenging, you know, because your operations are spread out across the entire U S most of the time. Can you run the bulk of your company on the GDS software? Like, yes. Mean, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, that, that's really the, the vision is they shouldn't need all this other uh, antiquated, yeah, they not connected even, things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with the exception of a few things, like we don't get into the the seismic side, the geospatial, um, you know, kind of like the geoscience side. We don't really get into any of that. Um, that's it's highly technical. It's highly specialized. Um, but we built the system in a way to where if they wanted to somehow view that information within GDS, they can do so. Okay. So we're not trying to get too much into the the. Uh, the geology side, um, we do have a lot of engineering tools, um, but yeah, not so much on the geology side. Okay, got it. So that makes sense. And then what's the, so people, they have like the way they collect and report on this data is all connected. But it, uh, I was at OTC a couple of weeks ago and they were also speaking about um, the companies and the operators, these ENP people, they don't want to give up their, their data for when they drill because that's their secret sauce and that's what they view as their you know, competitive differentiator. Is that related to this at all? That's only a problem. I've only seen that be a problem with super majors. Okay. So, uh, you know, Chevron, Shell, uh, ConocoPhillips, those kind of guys. Um, I've been in meetings with all of them. And whenever you start talking specifics, they kind of get hush hush. 
Okay. And they just give you the look like, hey, we can't talk about that. Yeah. Um, it's not so taboo in a way uh, with most operators, um, especially you know if if they're one of my clients. Like, I'm gonna see all of your data. <laughs> we, we, like, I have to put this in here for you. You know, yeah. we have to we have to go through a, a nice long implementation. So, um, you know, there's really no way necessarily around that. So, but n- nobody's really. Yeah, n- n- nobody's as secretive about that as the, as the, you know, the super majors because the they really they really do feel like that is their secret sauce. Okay, um, and then, so all of the all, these are all the problems you solve, but um, doesn't this present some problems for startups in general trying to attack this space? Because these people, you know, they they don't view change as something that they can make improvements for the better. It's they view that as you know, we we have works and you know let's just, let's just keep doing it like that. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge problem that you have to overcome. Um, and that's something every time we go into a company to talk to them, it's more of a, I mean, it's a long process to start off with. Um, sales cycles in this industry, especially for what we do, is you know 12 to 18 months. So you have to build a relationship and you have to let them know that you care about the way that they do business. You have to take on a trusted advisor. Um, yeah, I mean, they really have to, just have to trust you. Um, of course, you have to have a good product or service. That's a big part of that. Um, but I think you know one of the problems that you see with a lot of startups is they don't have a good sales team uh, or marketing team. Um, and I think with an oil and gas, I mean, especially I mean, most people that I've seen coming in, um, they're trying to start tech businesses with an oil and gas. And so they might be really technical, but they don't have any sales experience um, or marketing experience. And they really don't know how to relay that message into layman's terms um, of, you know, here's kind of our value proposition. Here's how we can help your business. Um, They like to talk about the, the features and the product and features and features and features, not like what are some of the benefits? Why why would this, why would this this company want to use your service or product? Yeah. Like what things am I dealing with that we fix right here with this software? Our company can fix for you. So, so, so if you want to, so if startups getting in, want to break down that barrier, but one, they need to understand the problem that they're trying to solve. And they need to understand the people that they're selling to um, very, 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 very well. Um, so the only way to really do that is to spend time. Um, so if you get a client on board, spend time. Go to their office. Spend time with the engineers um, like I've done. Um, learn exactly how they do their jobs so that way you can understand the problems firsthand. Uh, and therefore, you can build your either your product or you can build your services even better. And so would you say the things you just described, that's how y'all dealt with the problem? You're just getting to know the people and the business and spending time with the potential customers? Yeah, exactly. We spent, we spent a whole bunch of time talking to a whole lot of different companies, um, asking millions and millions of questions, um, really trying to get inside their head as, as to what their day looked like. Um, and, you know, for the most part, you know, uh, you know, say you talk to an engineer, their day is generally, for the most part, the same. Um, but you know, different engineers in different environments, different companies uh, experience different problems, and so that kind of helped us drive where we wanted to build the product next, and um, you know, more ways that we can actually provide value to these guys. Okay, that, that, that all sounds good. And you mentioned your network that you've sort of accrued over time, and that you know, your would you say your network is your net worth? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there's a lot of people you're talking about too, like the the oil and gas technology and startup scene. Well, is that mostly centralized in Houston? Are, are there other companies trying to you know take technology and make improvements for the better? Are they just who are these people that are talking about? What are they doing? How can people learn about them? I don't know if there's any sort of central hub for all this, but let's get these people talking to each other. Like, how can people listening now learn about this stuff and more about you know software and technology and oil and gas? Uh, I think a good place to start is to come if, if people want to like learn more about startups and stuff within the oil and gas space, um, they can come join us. I'm one of the, the I guess, kind of like co-founders, organizers uh, for the Society of Oil and Gas Entrepreneurs. It's a good place to start. Um, I would say at this point where we're at, um, it's, a, it's a good mixture of people who actually run startups. And, and it's, I think, more so now with our members, it's more people who are just they're really intrigued and they're interested and they may have some ideas. Um, you know, they want to make their leap from the, the nine to five to kind of like the entrepreneurial life. 
Um, and so that's what we get a lot of. How do you make um, that leap? Do you have to just start doing it after five, after the nine to five, or do you just kind of take a leap and figure it out and you know start working on it? <sighs> that's a really tough question to answer. Play both sides um, of the fence until you have a some sales and some business. It depends, um, and that's something I've thought about a lot because I've had people ask me that question more than not uh it seems like everybody i run into that hasn't made a leap they're like how do you make the leap or or they come up with a million excuses as to why they cannot make the leap um they'll be like oh i'm married i have kids i was like hey i was married whenever i don't have kids yet but i was married whenever i started the this company i took a very large pay cut we weren't paying ourselves very generously um you know it was it was definitely a struggle um but I think to kind of go from ground zero, if you want to be an entrepreneur, for the love of God, please solve a real problem. Um, because I say that because I talked to so many people who are like, yeah, I'm getting into the space and I'm starting a messaging app or I'm making a social network or I am, I run a team of offshore developers in India. It's like, come on guys, like there's, there's a million of these out there. Go out there, look at the world around you and think, what could be better? Um, and that can be within oil and gas. That can be within your daily life. Uh, it can be with anything. Um, I would never, if I was working like a good nine to five job, uh, I would never just quit my job to go start something that I thought was like, yeah, you know, this is kind of cool. Maybe this is a way for me to like build a business on. Like you have to be passionate. You have to be really, really passionate about the problems that you're solving because the entrepreneurial journey is, um, it's a hard one. Uh, in the last two years have been extremely difficult. Uh, there's been many times where it was, you know, pretty hard to bear. Um, you know, lots and lots of rejection, lots and lots of failures, lots of things to learn from. And nobody ever talks about that. Um, everybody always just sees the, the Mark Zuckerbergs, uh, or the, the WhatsApp guys, you know, the, the Instagram guys that are making billions of dollars. Um, and it, they, seem to kind of do that over overnight, even though they really didn't do it overnight. Um, and so I think a lot of people who are kind of getting into the space think that they have unrealistic expectations. If they're going to build an app or a company. And then I think even we were that way. Um, you know, we were thought that we were going to be, you know, billionaires overnight and that's not the reality. You know, most, most overnight successes take about eight to 10 years. Um, so if you're going to dedicate eight to 10 years of your life, for something, make sure it's a good idea. So you're not going to look back and be like, man, I really wish I didn't waste my, you know, waste eight, eight to 10 years of my life, you know, trying to sell a pet rock, you know, make sure you're like really into like what you're doing. And that's like, that's like the best advice that I give anybody who's like looking to get in the space. But if you have an awesome idea, if you have like the passion, and you have, you know, you're a little bit resourceful. I think that's all it really takes. Um, and you just got to be really, really, really driven. Um, and I think some of that can be learned, but I think some of that you're just born with. Um, and I think some people have that inside them and they don't know it. Um, and other people think they have it, but they really don't. Um, and what I mean by that is these last two years, um, if anybody who knows me knows that I work extremely long hours. Uh, I work weekends. I don't really take days off when I'm on vacation. I'm working. I'm on my laptop. I'm on the phone. Um, you have to be completely obsessive about what you do in your startup. Uh, and then maybe you'll be successful. <laughs> not saying that I'm like the, the benchmark for success or anything, but that's what I've learned so far. Uh, if you're not willing to work extremely, extremely hard, your competition will, and so, you know, will knock you off. Um, or you'll never even penetrate the market to begin with. Are there a lot of oil and gas startups? Uh, have you run into a lot of people like this? Cause like you said, the sales cycles are so long and all these projects are, they're so complex that, you have to know a lot about them and it takes a lot. You can't just build an app and like you said, be a billionaire overnight. Yeah, surprisingly enough for being networked with an oil and gas, there's actually not many people that I've ran into that actually run startups with an oil and gas. Um, I know you got some like the old surge guys, which you can run, I've run into some of them at OTC. Um, at some of like the startup pinch events. Uh, the surge I know guys. a lot of them. I know a lot of them kind of, yeah, like the surge guys. Um, I mean, I know who they are, but people that are listening, you know, yeah. So, so yeah, Surge was a uh, startup accelerator uh, in the oil and gas space. Um, they, Kurt Coburn, he was like the founder. He he shut that down uh, last month. He kind of posted a long, lengthy post about why it, it wasn't going to work. 
Um, and so now, you know, that's shut down and he still has his obligation to the startups there, um, which that's a whole nother topic. There's a whole lot of issues with that. Um, there's some new guys in town, uh, Station Houston. Um, I'm not really sure what their business model is. I don't know if it's just co-working space with like mentorships or if it's also an accelerator. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the state of the startup community, and I think there's a good startup community here, but I think it's very uh, dispersed. I don't think it's a very unified um, scene. Uh, you, you've got a lot of people got the start Houston. Now you got station Houston. Um, and then outside of Houston, or is like you said, there maybe there just aren't that many people attacking the oil and gas industry in, in general with you know fixing problems. Like if I'm anywhere around the world, because a lot of my people are in Texas or in Houston that are listening to the show, but I know there's people all around the country and the world that are listening. Yeah, I I don't I don't feel like there's a lot of companies coming in trying to tackle problems with oil and gas. Um, Would you say I there's problems to be solved? And I yeah, there's definitely problems to be solved, but I feel like because oil and gas is like this big scary industry um, where the there's a lot of barriers to entry um, and some of that's just the the habits of the people within um, and kind of their mindset but it's also it can be very capital extensive to to enter um, and I think because of that most people shy away you think yeah. I could never solve this problem I could never get the funding to do this um, and then what, that's not necessarily the, the case. What are the funding sources? Because through my own research, I found that there's the Houston Angel Network. And then I know that all of the big oil and gas companies have corporate venture arms. So where, if someone was, if they think they have a good idea, where would they go and look for funding? What, who are these people? What are the funding sources? So first and foremost, if you have a good product or service and you want funding, my best suggestion is try to at least sell something at first yeah. Um, because going to an investor empty handed looks terrible. Um, If you do that and if you can build up enough notoriety, kind of like the grassroots way, funding will find you. You don't have to look for funding. I know a lot of people that they're always saying, Hey, I need to, I need to find funding. Do you know anybody need to find funding? Um, And most of the time it's just because their product or service is not good enough or maybe they haven't sold it yet. Yeah. Um, I've had many, many people approach us since we got funding, uh, you know, to, you know, to give us another round of funding. Um, and it just becomes kind of easy. It actually kind of becomes annoying sometimes with people constantly sure. calling to, to, to fund you. Are you allowed um, to say who those people are? Uh, Probably not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I can, I, there's a few offhand, uh, Chevron technology ventures. Um, we were in talks with them, uh, at one point we didn't need the funding, so we didn't take it. Um, that's a good place to start if you're in oil and gas and you're looking to solve problems, but the, with, with Chevron technology ventures or BP, any of the super majors have really their own kind of like tech funds. It seems these days, uh, Chevron does, Conoco does, BP does. Are there oil and uh, gas, um, I guess venture capitalist firms or like, you know, I know in here in town there's mercury and a a couple other funds. Maybe where can people go? Um, I don't know any of the guys over at Mercury. I know they're, they're kind of like oil and gas centric. Yeah. Uh, so I mean that, that could be a good place to start. So just any, any funding sources in general, they don't have to be oil and gas specific. Just, you know, if you have a good product or service and you're selling things, people will find you, like you said, it really depends on what you're looking for in an investment. Um, so it, it depends on what the structure of the investment that you want. Um, but I think one of the big things when taking an investment, especially if you're like, say you like, you really want to get into oil and gas and you have like some experience, but you're not like a complete expert in the field that you're going into, but you know, there's a problem you want to solve it. It's probably better to get with an investor who has connections with an oil and gas or has a deep understanding of oil and gas rather than going to an investor outside of oil and gas and just taking his money. You know, if you if you find an investor with an oil and gas, you can at least take take some of that experience, take some of that network, um, and I think that'll really help you along to the next stage. Um, that's that's a huge thing to consider whenever taking funding is is you know, do you want them to be a mentor? Um, and I, I think that's that should be a conversation. That should be kind of like a almost like a two way interview um, whenever taking funding. It shouldn't just be like, hey, you you pitch in the investor. It's like, well, what can you offer me? Yeah. What can you offer my company? Um, you know, why should I invest? Why should I take your money? 
as, a, as opposed to taking somebody else's money or some other firm's money. Um, because you want, it, you need that to be a good fit and there needs to be a good mutual understanding. Um, and if you've never taken funding before, obviously investors have an end game, they have their own angle. Um, so they're looking for an exit. Uh, they're looking for a merger or acquisition uh, of some sort or IPO. Um, and if you don't plan on doing those, then you're probably not going to get funding. Um, that's just how it works because I mean, they're, they're looking to make money on their money. Um, so if sense. you just want to, if you just want to grow your company forever, um, and not go IPO and keep it private, then you're not going to get funding. So that's just kind of a, the lowdown on that. Okay. So if people want to learn more about you or reach out to you, how, how should they do so? Uh, if you want to learn more about me, uh, I guess I'm most active probably on LinkedIn. Uh, you can just go to LinkedIn and search Jacob Corley, C-O-R-L-E-Y. Uh, or if you want to learn more about GDSware and kind of find out what we do, you can go to www.gdsware.com. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't really do the whole – I mean I have a Twitter, but I don't really do the whole Twitter thing. Okay. All right, Jake. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on today. All right. Thanks, James. When you hear this music, that means you're listening to the OGYP tech segment. Today, we'll answer the questions, what is the cloud and where is it? So in simple terms, I did a bunch of research and basically what the cloud is, is a network of computers connected to the internet that collect and share in information. The cloud got started in the mid 90s when engineers started drawing a cloud picture to refer to all the connected computers that talk to each other. In 1996, engineers at Compaq first coined the term cloud computing. And less than a year later, in 1997, at the same sort of conferences that today's iPhones get announced at, called WWDC, Apple's then-CEO Steve Jobs described what would later become the iCloud. Instead of only storing files on your computer, on your personal hard drive, today you pay Apple and Google or insert big tech company to store and give you the ability to access it on their servers. The cloud allowing companies like GDSWare to build software to help solve the oil and gas data problem or to let you access your selfie or Excel spreadsheet anywhere that's connected to the internet. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to learn more about a specific technology segment to be covered here or topic that you don't understand. To watch Steve Jobs' old school WWDC speech or if you'd like to learn more about the cloud, you can visit the show notes at jamesgordy.com backslash OGYP5. All right, we go from learning about the cloud to the cloudy identity of the one person who left the review since the last episode. We have one five-star review from Anonymous, so I appreciate the review. But also that means that uh, basically everyone who's listening to the show has not left a review. And the reason I'm asking for that, it's the number one thing you can do to help the show. As with, as DJ Khaled would say, it's the major key. And the reason it's that is because it's helped push the show to the top, of, the top of the iTunes search rankings, which helps more people find the show. If you want to help out the show and do me a personal favor, you can go to jamesgordy.com backslash review. And you can find this on my website, as we discussed. You can find the show notes, OGYP-5. And then also, we're on iTunes and Stitcher. If you would like to find the contact info to hit me up, I really would appreciate it. I'd like to hear from everyone. I know we have people listening in the UK and Australia and about 20 other countries in addition to the US around the world right now. And I'd love to hear from each and every, every person that's listening. So your feedback, your questions, your concerns. If you hate me, you like me, you know, I'd like to start a conversation about it. So you can find all my contact info. That's LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, email. I'll answer all of them. You can find that on the show notes one last time. That's where you can go to find out any of the things from the show that you want to learn more about that maybe you couldn't write down when you were listening. It's going to be jamesgordy.com backslash OGYP5. Talk to you next week.
So I'm going to try to hopefully see if they don't call me again. Yeah, the good thing about this whole system is, um, you know, we can edit it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's try this again. I'm probably going to get it because it's my dad. So he's going to keep calling until I answer in a second. But um, I'll just keep ignoring him. <laughs>